Merry Christmas again. You having a good party so far? I think it would be appropriate for us to spend just a few minutes contemplating the reason for the season, the reason that we are all here. Probably the most famous verse of all the nativity verses is this one, Luke 2, 7, from the King James Version. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I've heard all of my children say that from memory at one time or another. And as I have thought about it in preparation for our time together this evening, I wonder who it is in that verse that you and I probably most identify with. Don't know about you all out there, but I have a hard time identifying with Mary, and it's hard for me to put myself even in Joseph's shoes. But the innkeeper, I get that. I get that. I wonder, is the innkeeper really such a bad guy? Or is it possible that he's just a busy guy? Of all the characters in this story, I think that he is the one that we can most identify with because that night he wasn't being particularly nasty. He was just busy. All the rooms were filled. All the reservations had been made months in advance. And someone just shows up at his door and wants a place. I identify with it, and I think maybe you do too, because all too often, we don't make room for Jesus either. You know, there's something about making room, because you have to move. (laughs) You can't just make room for someone without you moving. I remember, now this is a long time ago, I know some of you is hard to believe, but there was a time when Mary Kay and I were just starting off our family. And we'd had uh, Jennifer. She was just over a couple years old. Mary Kay was well advanced in her pregnancy expecting Jonathan. And it was a hot summer night. And in preparation for the fact that we knew we were going to need to move Jonathan into the crib, we decided that we would move Jennifer into her own room. Now, you know how it is, for those of you who have raised firstborns, you do everything a little bit too early. And we probably moved Jennifer into her own room a little bit too early. The reason I know it's too early is because the house we lived in was very small at the time, and there was just a little room for the crib, and there was a little room for Jennifer, and believe it or not, there was also just a very little bedroom for Mary Kay and me. We had a double bed in there, and the two of us by this point in time really had a hard time fitting in there because we were also making room for an almost baked Jonathan. And that night, summer night, there was a thunderstorm. Well, you all know where this is going, right? What two year old in a new room stays in her room in a thunderstorm? Nobody, but especially Jennifer. For those of you who know Jennifer, she is a classic firstborn. She doesn't wait to be invited for anything. She just goes. When when the heart moves her, she moves. And she moved that night into our room. And there was no saying no to Jennifer. That was the beginning of a very long journey with my children. I still have a very hard time saying no to them, especially to Jennifer. So we made room for Jennifer in our bed. And you know what that means? That means that I was laying kind of just on the side, balancing between whether or not I was going to stay on the bed or fall off. That's what it means to make room. It means to give up a space, to give up a place, to give up a right that we may have for someone else. I think 
very briefly, there are four places in our life that if we were to think about it on this Christmas special night, four places that we need to make room for Jesus. And I'm going to start with the very first one that probably will surprise you. But the first place we need to make room for Jesus is in our sin. Sin? Oh my goodness, Pastor Mark, it's Christmas Eve. You're going to talk to us about sin tonight. Well, yes, I am. You know why? Simply this. It's the reason behind it all. Also, a nativity verse that we don't often think about, but Matthew 121 is this. The angel says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You see, that's the reason he came. Now, on Christmas Eve, there are two groups of people that I want to talk to tonight. The first group of people, you can self-identify, no raising hands necessary tonight. But the first group of people for you is the, what I would call, the no big deal crowd. Are you in the no big deal crowd? My sin is the same as everyone else. I can't help it. God made me. God loves me anyway. He understands. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that sin is a big deal. Sin is such a big deal that God sent his only son. Now, we don't need to get into a big, long theological discussion about sin. We mostly know what it is. Basically, sin means to miss the mark, to do what we know God doesn't want us to do, or to not do what God does want us to do. Ultimately, sin means that we, as the creations of God, as men and women and boys and girls, we become less than what God originally intended. And so when we, if we're in this no big deal crowd, when we minimize our sin, we minimize the real reason for Christmas. I would like this to be the Christmas when we say no more. Not in my strength, by the way, but in God's. Making room for Jesus basically is this. It means trusting Christmas. Trusting Christmas, which is another way of saying trusting Christ's mass or trusting Christ's service. Trusting the service, the work, the mass of Christ to save me from my sin. Now, some of you are not in the no big deal crowd. In fact, for some of you, sin has become such a big deal in your life that you are in the second group, what I would call the give up and done crowd. Anyone here in the give up and done crowd? I've tried the Christian path. I've tried to live it right. And I have found I'm just unable to do it. I can't seem to help myself. I have an old Pastor Mark, if only you knew. I have a big sin. I don't have those puny little sins that other people have. I have a big, big sin, and I can't seem to forgive myself of it, let alone expect God to forgive me. And I'm feeling defeated. I'm feeling done. And if you're in this group, I have good news for you, because for you... Making room for Jesus means believing his promise. There is a promise, and it goes like this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we don't make room for Jesus and believe this verse, then basically what we are saying is, is that I don't trust Christ. I don't think he is able, and I don't think any of us want to say that. Tonight maybe is the night for you to make room for Jesus. In this Christmas, in this year of 2017, by letting him work on your sin condition. If it's a big deal in your life, then I have good news for you. We have a big God. Don't give up. Believe. So, for some of us, 
Making room for Jesus means making room for him in our sin. Let me give you another place where on this Christmas we may need to make room for Jesus, and that is, okay, you guys ready? Ready to hold on? We need to make room for Jesus in our mornings. Now, we're here in the evening, but I promise you morning is coming. And here tonight, I know that there is such a thing that we identify as morning people and not morning people. For the most part, Mary Kay and I are morning people. And I don't know how we did it, but we gave birth to four non-morning people. (laughs) Maybe you're here tonight and you're a morning person and you're married to a not morning person. But I do know one thing that I think is true of all of us, whether we're morning people or not. Our mornings are very busy. Are your mornings very busy? From the time that that clock alarms you first thing in the morning, it's like the bell that wakes you of all the things that you have to do in the next 30 minutes or the next 40 minutes to catch a bus, to catch a car, to get to work, to eat the breakfast, to skip the breakfast, to get on. You know, there's just a whole long list of things that we have to do. But did you know that Jesus, this Jesus that we sang happy birthday tonight, did you know that he is a morning person? He is. Let me share another verse with you from Mark chapter 1. Again, all these verses are in the early Gospels, what we consider some of the nativity parts. But here we see Mark 1, 35 to 37, Jesus already ministering. And here's what it says, very early in the morning. I can imagine maybe the sun hasn't even come up yet. I guess I don't have to imagine it. What's the next thing it says? While it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. You know, I know this cannot be right. I hope that I didn't copy it over to here. I did. It was not a military place. (laughs) This is one of those moments when you look at your notes and you say, you know, I just know that can't be right. (laughs) God, help me that I didn't copy that to the slide. (laughs) He went off to a solitary place (laughs) where he prayed. Now, Simon and his companions, that's Peter, went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. I think that Jesus understands your hurry in the morning because he was surrounded by people who were also hurried in the morning. They were hurried. They had things to do. Jesus had things to do. And his way of dealing with those mornings was to get off, get away, get by himself so that he could have some time with his heavenly father. Yes, he was incredibly busy. But because of that, he had to get himself up extra early. He had to hide away, and even then they came looking for him. If there is one thing that I could challenge you to in 2018, it is to make room for Jesus in your mornings. First thing every day. Some of you know that I'm a big fan of the Bible app. That's the app that brings up the Bible right in your mobile phones, your mobile devices. I would suggest that you be intentional about it. That you actually maybe, if you're going to set an alarm for other things in your life, maybe you need to set a reminder in your phone to be in the Bible first thing in the morning. It doesn't have to be long but maybe at least five minutes when every morning you can say, Jesus, this morning, I am making room for you in my busy life. Because you see, this will not happen by accident. Many years ago, I began the habit of actually leaving my home and going to a local diner. And some of you have caught me there. But I spend that time sitting at a booth, mostly by myself, imagining 
that Jesus is on the other side of the table. And I'm in his word. We often do the crossword puzzles together. He's much better at it than I am. And sometimes we even read the sports page. But we're always in the word together. And I encourage you to make room in this area of your life. Make room for Jesus in your sin. Make room for Jesus in your mornings. And here is a third place that you can make room for Jesus. And this one might surprise you because this is such a family night. But many of us need to make room for Jesus in our family. Do you make room for Jesus in your family? Do you talk in your family about what God is doing? Do you share prayers with one another? You see, God had this in mind for every single family, that every family actually would be like a small church. This is not something that's in the Gospels. This is something that's very early in the Bible. We go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 where we read this. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. This is so important to you moms and dads who are here with us tonight that have children at home. You have this great opportunity and this awesome responsibility. It's up to you to make it happen. You be the spiritual leaders in your family. But what about the rest of us that maybe don't have small children at home? Those of us who are single or empty nesters or who are a widow or a widower. Well, spiritual family for us is more important than ever. Vital that we make room for our spiritual family with one another. You see, Colossians 3.16 says this to all of us. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through the psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. That's what we're doing here tonight. So find people that you can hang out with. Find people that... Together, you can make room for Jesus this year. Find people who need your encouragement. Find people that you can pray for God to provide for you. Pray to God. Ask him to provide you the family that you need. Because we never run out of need for people to come alongside of us. We make room for Jesus by making room for Jesus' people. And then last but not least... And here we're going to round the basis and bring it home. We need to make room for Jesus in our Christmas. It might sound like an oxymoron to say that we should make room for Jesus at Christmas. But do you know this is more true now than ever before? I'm going to quote just a few statistics, but you know this to be true without me saying anything. Pew Research every three years releases a survey. They just did it this past week. Nine in ten adults in America celebrate Christmas. But for the first time since Pew Research has conducted this survey, less than half, 46% precisely, define Christmas as a religious holiday. That's down from 51% in 2014. In other words, in the last three years, We've gone from almost half to less than half. Now, that may not surprise you, but this will. Only 32% of those who celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday, only 32% said the fact that less than half of us celebrate it as a religious holiday, only 32% of them said that it bothered them even slightly. In fact, the headline that had this article in it on Tuesday when Jesus and I were having breakfast together said this, more jingle, less Jesus. Christmas matters to mankind. Christmas matters to all of you. But it should matter that it doesn't matter to other people as well. Isaiah announced eight centuries before Christ. Think of this, 800 years before Christ was born. 
For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Does that sound familiar? We just sang it. Did you know that the words to that song were written not recently, not at Christmas time two centuries ago, but 800 years before Jesus was born? It goes on to say, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If ever there was a time when we, as a people, when we, as a country, need a mighty counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace, would you agree with me that these are the days when that's true? Now, I'm not saying that you have to get into an argument with everyone you talk to about the real reason for the season, but you don't have to punt You don't have to excuse your beliefs either. You don't have to say happy holidays. You you can say Merry Christmas. It's okay. You see, Merry Christmas makes room for Jesus. Happy holidays squeezes him out. And along with squeezing out Jesus, we squeeze out the hope of God becoming man. We squeeze out the hope of a just and fair government upon his shoulders. We squeeze out the wonderful counselor, the idea of the mighty God who is an everlasting father to us. And we squeeze out the prince of peace in these not peaceful, divisive times. If ever we need to make room for Jesus, I submit to you that it's now. It's now. 